create a VLAN, step one. And step two is assigning that VLAN to a port. And as soon as that port becomes part of that one VLAN, it becomes an access port. Especially the command switch port mode access unconditionally sets that port to access mode and then the command switch port access VLAN and then the VLAN ID, in this case it being 150. So switch port access VLAN 150 puts that port in VLAN 150. So that was the first type of link we covered that can exist on a switch, which is your access link. The second type of link that can exist on a switch is your trunk link. A trunk link can carry more than one VLAN at a time. Why would that be needed? Well, we'll go to our little box diagram again. This is switch one, and the link between them, and this is switch two. Both of these are connected to each other on fast ethernet zero slash 24, or port 24. And let's say, we have PC1 in VLAN, so I'm going to shorten VLAN to VL10, and PC2 on switch 2 in VLAN10, then PC3 on switch 1 in VLAN20, and PC4 on switch 2 in VLAN20. If this link between switch 1 and switch 2, this port 24, if we were to put that in VLAN 10, then only PC1, which is in VLAN 10, and PC2, which is in VLAN 10, can talk to each other. Remember I said that VLANs can transverse switches? Well, at this point, we are only transversing VLAN 10 across this link, connecting the two switches on port 24. PC3 and PC4, yeah, they can't talk to each other. If I were to put this link in VLAN 20, then PC3 and PC4 would be able to talk to each other, but PC1 and 2, nope, they wouldn't be able to talk to each other. I have another option. I could create another link between these two devices, F0 slash 23, F0 slash 23 on both ends and have one carry VLAN 10 and the other one carry VLAN 20. But then again, that's a waste of ports. What if you have 10 VLANs per switch? You're going to use up 10 ports on each switch just to carry the VLAN across? So Cisco came up with a better idea. How about we have one link between the switches. Let's keep it F0 slash 24 and F0 slash 24 and allow it to carry both VLAN 10 and 20. And now you're not wasting ports because over one port you're carrying multiple VLANs, more than one VLAN. And a trunk link is a link that carries more than one VLAN at a time. But how does this happen? When PC1 tries to talk to PC2 and PC3 tries to talk to PC4 at the same time, remember this is full duplex, the sending switch sends all its frames on port 24 out towards switch 2. How will switch 2 know which frame belongs to which VLAN? How will switch 2 differentiate between frames coming from PC1, which is in VLAN 10, and frames coming from PC3, which is in VLAN 20? And the answer is frame tagging. Switch 1 will actually put an identifier on the frame telling the frame that, okay, you're part of VLAN 10. And another frame from PC3, for example, will have a tag put in it saying that you're, this frame is from VLAN 20. So each frame coming from PC1 or PC3, when the switch sends it out towards, switch 1 sends it out towards switch 2, will have an identifier inside of it identifying the VLAN that the frame belongs to. So when switch two receives a frame coming from PC1, the frame will have an ID in it that says this frame belongs to VLAN 10. So that way switch two will know to forward this frame out to PC2. A frame from PC3 
Switch 1 will add a tag to it saying this frame belongs to VLAN 20. So when Switch 2 receives the frame from PC3, Switch 1 would have already tagged it within VLAN ID of 20. So Switch 2 will know this frame goes to VLAN 20, or in this case, PC4. Now, how is this done? This frame tagging is done using one of two protocols. The first one, so this is the subheading, frame tagging or trunking protocols. The first one is inter-switch link. Now, what inter-switch link does, and inter-switch link is Cisco proprietary, so you cannot run inter-switch link or the short form ISL on a non-Cisco device. ISL is Cisco proprietary. Now what ISL does is it takes the original frame, for example, a frame coming from VLAN 10, and it encapsulates or it surrounds the original frame in a new header or in a new frame. A new 26-byte frame with a 26-byte header and a 4-byte footer, so a total of 30 bytes. So ISL puts a new frame around the original frame. And this new frame has a field in it that identifies the VLAN the frame belongs to. So you take the frame, think of the frame, original frame as a, as a letter, and you put it in a new envelope. Or you put the envelope in another bigger envelope. That new frame, the ISO frame, has a field inside of it that says VLAN ID is 10 or VLAN ID is 20. So the ISO frame has an identifying field for the VLANs that's being carried inside. The other one is the open standard, which is IEEE 802.1Q. And by open standard, I mean all networking devices or all switches can use this. It is not Cisco proprietary. What 802.1Q or the short form .1Q does is inserts a four byte field. Just in takes a four byte field and inserts it in the original frame. And that four byte field is a tag identifying what VLAN this frame belongs to. So if the frame belongs to VLAN 10, that tag will say VLAN 10. It's just inserted into the original frame. Keep in mind though, that the maximum transmission unit for ethernet is 1500 bytes. When you add four bytes of a dot one Q trunk to it, you get a frame that is 1504 bytes. This little tidbit of information come in, will come in handy when you get to your CCNPs. For now, it's irrelevant kind of for CCNA, but do remember it. Also, the 802.1Q trunking protocol has a feature called the native VLAN feature. The native VLAN of a .1Q trunk is the VLAN that is not tagged over the trunk. So let's say I have VLAN 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50. VLAN 10 is getting tagged. VLAN 20 is getting tagged. So as soon as the frames from VLAN 10 transfers the trunk, a tag of 10 is added, or dot one q tag of 10 is added to those frames. For VLAN 20, a tag of 20 is added. For VLAN 30, a tag of 30 is added. Let's say VLAN 40, I make it the native VLAN of my trunk. There is not going to be a tag that is going to be added to VLAN 40. So the native VLAN of a dot one q trunk is the VLAN that transverses the trunk without being tagged. And you will see this happen on our lab. So between ISL and dot one q, which one's better? The answer being the one with less overhead. ISL or inter-switch links adds a 26 byte header. That's a lot of overhead. That's a lot, of, that, that's a lot more work a switch has to do to process that frame. A four byte field, a little tag, four byte tag inserted into the original frame is much easier to process. So the sending device adds the tag and identifies the frame 
uh, with the VLAN it belongs to, and the receiving switch reads the tag, says, okay, this frame belongs to VLAN 10, for example, and then removes the tag and forwards the frame out to VLAN 10. Before we get to the configuration part of the trunking, take note that you can manually configure trunks, and eventually we're going to end up manually configuring trunks, but there is a protocol called dynamic trunking protocol, which is my next topic. So, protocol called dynamic trunking, or DTP for short. Dynamic trunking protocol performs automatic trunk negotiation between switches that are connected on ports. So, if switch A is connected to switch B on port 24, dynamic trunking protocol under certain circumstances will automatically bring up a trunk on those ports. So dynamic trunking protocol can run in one of three modes. The first mode is dynamic desirable. The switch port, if it is in dynamic desirable mode, it will send DTP frames and it will respond to DTP frames. So it will both send and respond to DTP frames from the other end of the link. As the name says, a trunk is desirable. So if the other side is sending me dynamic trunking protocol frames, I will respond to them. If the other side is quiet, I'm going to send it DTP frames. Basically, the port on the local side and the port on the remote side are trying their best to bring up the trunk. So they are negotiating with each other, talking DTP with each other, trying to bring up a trunk when it's in dynamic desirable mode. Take note that switch models in the Cisco genre or the Cisco world, switch models that end with the number 50. So for example, a switch model 3550, which I have at home, will have by default all its ports in dynamic desirable mode. If two switches that are both 3550s are connected back to back with each other with a cable, a crossover cable, if you remember, two similar devices use a crossover cable. So if I just connect two 3550 switches to each other, a trunk is automatically going to come up because they're going to talk DTP and both sides are going to be in dynamic desirable mode. Both sides are going to send DTP frames and respond to frames from the other side and the trunk will automatically come up. The second mode is your dynamic auto mode. In dynamic auto mode, the port will respond to DTP frames from the other end, from the remote side, but it will not send. It will not send DTP frames. So, in dynamic desirable mode, the port initiates trunking. It wants to create a trunk. Hence, it starts sending DTP frames and also responding to DTP frames from the other side. But basically, the port initiates the trunking. In dynamic auto mode, a port will not initiate trunking. Yes, it will respond to DTP frames from the other end. So if the other end is dynamic desirable, it will respond to DTP frames from the other side and a trunk will come up, but it will in itself not initiate trunking by sending DTP frames. Now, switch models that end in the number 60, like the switch model 3560, automatically have all their ports in dynamic auto mode. By default, have all their ports in dynamic auto mode. So if you connect two 3560 switches back to back with each other with a crossover cable, will a trunk come up? Nope. Because both sides will sit there and wait for the other side to initiate trunking. In dynamic auto, you respond to DTP frames, you don't send them. So both sides will sit there and just basically no trunk will come up. So for our labs, did I pick the type of switches where a trunk will come up automatically? Or did I pick one where you will have to configure a trunk? Well, of course, I picked 3560s because I don't want my trunks to come up automatically because I want us to do the work. The third mode is simply mode on. This says, I don't care what the other side is. 
I want to set my site unconditionally to a trunk. So sets the local port to trunking unconditionally. Now, mode on will also send and respond to DTP frames. You'll set your side to on, and then if the other side sends you DTP frames, you will respond to them, and you all will also send DTP frames to the other side. So if you have two sides, and both of them are desirable, desirable, yes, trunk comes on. Desirable auto, trunk comes on. Desirable on, trunk comes on. Auto and on, trunk comes on. The only time the trunk doesn't come up automatically is when you have both sides as auto. So if you have auto on one side and auto on the other side, you won't automatically get a trunk, which is ideal, actually. So we're done with the theory part of this lecture. Let's get on the lab, and I will show you the commands to configure trunks.